If you're applying for their job, you are wondering why just applying is not working anymore. Uh, how should you network? What you have adjust in your job search to stand out from the crowd? We're going to answer during our podcast today with uh, Adil Mansour. He's a director of engineering. And we're going to do uh, mock interviewing each other uh, for specific question about the bugs that were missed to the production. How do you deal with that? And also we're going to talk about the questions that you should ask during the interview and the questions you may don't want to ask. I am a uh, director of engineering at Chow Now. I've been here almost five years now and I joined the team to help develop and grow the QA and SDET. Since then, my role has expanded to engineering op, all of engineering operations, security, infrastructure, DevOps, IT engineering. All right, let's talk about uh, this is actually something that uh, recently came up three, five times. I'm getting uh, messages in my LinkedIn profile that, hey, Evgeny, I saw a video. I see that you can, you have a network. I'm looking for a job, trying to apply. And this type of messages I'm getting every day. I'm trying to reply back to most messages. Uh, and uh, again, what, what, what is your thoughts like? Uh, what is your observation at this moment? Uh, and I'll share my thoughts as well about the QA jobs market, how to search. Yeah, I, I think really the market is interesting right now. And it's I think it's even changed in the past six months. For a long time there, post-pandemic, it was very much, and even a little bit before the pandemic, there was just a few months in between where market was weird. But it's been an employee's market. It's the job searcher's market for a while. And that obviously started to change last year. And this year, more and more, you can tell that now it's definitely an employer's market. There are jobs to be had out there for sure. But the amount of qualified candidates that I'm hearing from people for whether it's for junior positions, but especially with experienced positions or even management positions, getting a lot of qualified candidates in a very short period of time. I'll, I'll make a comparison. I won't name the company. Many of you and I know the company, but I won't name the company as an example right before the pandemic. This is five years ago. They posted director position. It took them three months to, to fill it. That same mm -hmm. company posted another director position recently. And, and you and I were chatting about it. And they were able to get enough qualified candidates in two, two weeks. So obviously, it's their jobs to be had. But the amount of qualified ca candidates that folks are competing with is, is at the high end. That's what I'm seeing. What about you? Totally. I honestly had different thoughts about this year. Mm -hmm. So last year was a lot of layoffs and it flattered, like not stopped completely, but not like skyrocketed, like with all mm -hmm. these layoffs, but still it's happening. And this year I was thinking, okay, maybe uh, 2024, the first uh, three, four months, it's going to be same, but then maybe they will start hiring again and uh, it's not happening. And what is another thing is what I mentioned. All candidates right now, like they are applying like crazy. 30, 40 resumes, not resumes, like applications per day. And it's not just, it's not just working. It's not working anymore. Like just with applying a cult, even as you just mentioned, great candidates, good, uh, like experienced one with a tremendous uh, experience. They struggling as well. I'm not even saying about junior guys like who just entered to the market. I think not uh, based on my experience and based on what I saw, the only way how you can find the job right now, even if you experience or not experience and through this, through the networking, through the even direct messaging in called in the LinkedIn, it's still called. It, it works better than just applying. It definitely works better than apply and forget. Apply, forget doesn't work. If you apply sending messaging, chances are high, a little higher. It's also really interesting. What are, you, what are some of the trends you're seeing in this one? Because there are a couple of people I spoke to. One of them was senior people. One of them was in the job market for six months. The other one was for one year. And they had the luxury to, there's some privilege here. They had the luxury to really look for the, get, wait for the right offer. They had a the luxury. They were, yeah. But what's interesting about those two stories was they were actually, the jobs they ended up getting were through cold applications, mm. but you, but leveraging some services out there to, to get their resumes out. That's a really interesting space. I haven't looked into it too much recently, but they're definitely an anomaly. Most of the folks who are getting jobs are mm. through 
some sort of some sort of reach out, somebody who's able to get there, put in a word to the either recruiter or the hiring manager. Totally. This is I think this is a game changer. If you can able to bring your resume to the table to the hiring manager, because most of like resumes, they're not getting it. They're just stuck in the applicant tracking systems because you're getting hundreds of resumes per day. And if you, it's not about even the keywords anymore, <laughs> I'll tell you like a, a short story. Just recently, yesterday, I got a message from my friend. I referred her to one company. She had a she had an experience in QA for a, quite a while, like three, four years, and then she actually started her own business, and she had a gap like within one year, but she had a really good reference from the previous employer. And also, I also know her, like, personally. So what happened, she reached out to me and she asked me, oh, you're getting help with looking into my resume. I'm applying and I'm not getting anything right, right now. I was applying, like, quite a while as well. I, so I told her, yeah, yeah, definitely, just send me over. And again, she wasn't, I knew her. I knew mm-hmm. her and she actually did some favor for me too. So I felt I had to help her. Yeah. Yeah. So she sent me over and then at that day, I think that the same day, basically, another mm-hmm. dude reached out to me and he said, we are looking for a contract position. Boom. Referred her right away. And she ended up hiring within a week. Like the the interview process was like lightning fast. And yeah, another story. So this type of story is a lot when someone's referring to someone and you know him and you can tell, yeah, I definitely can recommend him. So what I'm saying is I think you should try this route for sure. Let your close network know that you are searching right now. Desperately or not, that doesn't really matter, but let people know if you don't know. Totally. And I think what's really changed when it comes to your resumes, people talk about like resumes or they want feedback on outreach, they want feedback on their interviewing skills. What's changed to summarize all that, bring it all. What's changed is you were doing that before, four, five, three years ago. You were doing that in order to maximize your offer, right? You were focusing on those interviewing skills to maximize offer. Now you're focusing on getting your foot in the door. That's what's that's what's really changed. Because previously you could have, if you had the experience and you had the skills, there would be enough jobs out there you may not qualify for everything, but there would be enough jobs out there that you'd be able to turn around and get a job fairly quickly. But now you need those things just to get your foot in the door, to give yourself the best possible chance. I think that's the big change in the market, even from last year to this year. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Another question I'm getting, Adil, like for those who are searching for the first job, this is an evergreen question, I think, right? Like. Still, circumstances are changing, and in today's market, what do you think, how they should approach to the, finding the first job, especially with their resumes, like how, what they can put in their resumes? And this is something that we can touch on the resume review as well, maybe general advice. Yeah, I think the advice remains the same. There's going to be a lot of, you're going to have a lot of competition. So you need to play, you need to play the numbers game and try to differentiate yourself any way you can, even if whether you are self-taught, whether you are going to boot camp, whether you are looking for an internship while in college or you're about to graduate, it's the same advice. It's a numbers game. So you have to, your area, like looking for a job for you is definitely a full-time job. And that's for everybody now, but it's definitely a full-time job. When you're looking at resumes, when you're looking at your LinkedIn profiles, if it's a technical coding position, you're looking at your GitHub profile, you're looking to differentiate, you're looking to continuing to look to network, but it's it's a numbers game. You have to put yourself out there. And I think, especially for those who are like maybe self-taught or bootcamp, figure out a way to put yourself out there sooner. The sooner, the better. If you put together a whole, hey, I'm going to one one year plan, two year plan. No, you need to be able to learn much faster, get your name out there much faster because it's going to be it's going to be a little bit of a of a journey. So that would be my suggestion, whether it's open source, if it's whether it's open source projects, special projects you can do, anything you can do to differentiate yourself from just, hey, I went to a boot camp. Hey, I, I went to college. 
anything you can do beyond that is going to give you a leg up. It that's I think that's like the first part. I'm I'm sure there's definitely other parts to it, but that's definitely the first part. Go wide, put yourself out there and and look to differentiate wherever you can whenever you can as you learn more uh, about the positions you're targeting. Yeah, totally. Same thing with the meetups. I think uh, people remember like last year when we hosted the meetups, we got quite a while people who were also searching for the first job. And that's, uh, remember lady sh who drove- Phoenix, uh, Phoenix, Phoenix, to, right? Phoenix to Southern California. Yeah, to, so to Southern California to attend on the meetup. That's a dedication. People, if you're willing to do this type of- Talk about differentiation. That's something that's gonna stick in my mind. I think later on, she did re reach out to me over over LinkedIn, and I, I was able to give additional pointers. What's that day? I probably met like 100 people. I'm not sure how many people were at that event that day. And she really stuck out differentiating herself, putting herself out there. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like standing out from the crowd. Let's give some more examples because we're talking about networking, but uh, at the same time, how to network correctly. Not correctly, let's say what it works for me, maybe not works for someone else. Do you have some ideas here? Like how would you approach with the networking? What do you think? Two things come to mind. One thing is if people in your in your within your circle, within your social circle, whether that work in the fields or the companies that, that you're targeting, reaching out to them is really powerful. They could be family members, they could be friends, they could be neighbors. Those are really powerful. There's a whole there's a whole study done on the importance of weak connections. Let's say Evgeny and I are our best friends. I ask him, hey, can you help me out with this job? Evgeny's not this way, but help me out with this job. And he doesn't think I'm a good fit. He'll just blow me off. If Evgeny has another friend who I'm not friends with, and he refers me to that person, the weak link connection, there's a whole study out there. Maybe we can spend like one podcast just talking about it, how important networking and weak connections are. So start with your people, see if they know somebody they can refer you. That's a really good place to start. And they can give you very specific advice because advice is always contextual. They can give you much, much more specific advice, but not everybody's going to, that's a luxury. Not everybody's going to have that, especially if you're coming from underrepresented group, it's more likely that there aren't any people in your network who are doing the types of job that you want to actually do. That's where meetups come in. Uh, that's where social media com comes in big time. Even cold outreach on LinkedIn can be really, really powerful. Also, I heard this advice from some other podcasts. I don't remember which one. But in terms of networking, it's not reaching out and asking something. It's actually reaching out and offering a help with something or helping something. <laughs> that's a, actually people saying, oh, this is a network. So how you can provide a value to a person whom you are reaching out, especially if you are going in cold. If you called uh, LinkedIn, called emailing, it's very similar. You, you're getting this all the time from uh, recruiters, from salesperson, from other companies, and they all asking basically, hey, can, I, can I have your five minute, like 15 minute chat with you about our product? I think we've talked about this, the Dale Carnegie book, how to win friends and influence people. Mm -hmm. The concepts there are like nothing new. Actually, that book was pretty old, but you can read psychology, psychology books on the topic. But basically the premise is when you're reaching out to people, communicate, talk about things that are important. Starting out with things that are important to them is a really good way to be more, to have your outreach be more personable as opposed to being a turn off, if you will. How you can practice your inter the interview process what you should focus on. Because if you're going for engineering position, a lot of people focusing just on the technical, like on the lead code, and which is also a must. At the same time, I saw a lot of times when, when candidates, they did well on the technical part of the interview, but they didn't really do well on the behavioral interviews. You have to really understand the interviewers perspective on that. What they're trying to do, they're trying to find examples of specific skills or qualities that they they that they believe will be are important to be successful in this position. So when you approach it that way, you it just really changes the, the perspective. You're able to answer the question in a way that helps the interviewer nail down those examples. As an example, nobody's going to ask, hey, Evgeny, are you a team player? They're not going to ask 
that question and the answer, because the answer is meaningless, you're going to say yes, right? Instead, they're going to ask, tell me about a time where you had to work on a, where you had to work with a, with it on a, where you had to work on a particularly challenging project within a team. What was your contribution to the project and how did you approach it? They're going to ask you in that way. And you're able to, if you're able to connect those things, you're, it's going to maximize your chances of getting that offer. And it's going to maximize the chance of that offer being the highest offer that it can be, right? I always say this, your biggest, if you really we, we start talking about the tail end of it, you start talking about like negotiation, your biggest leverage is going to be a strong interview. And your strong interview is going to be because of how, you, how you're able to master and answer behavioral questions. They've looked at your resume. They've had screening with you. They know you meet the minimum required skills for the position. At the tail end of it, when you look at it, it's all going to be about behavioral questions. It's how do you prepare for them? How do you answer for them? Some companies are going to be a lot more, even figuring out how different companies approach these questions is really important. As an example, if you interview at some place like Amazon, they have, they have these, these skill-focused, these behavioral question-focused interview. They're only going to ask you three or four in a 45-minute in an hour interview. That's very different from, let's say, I'll use example when I'm hiring, I might have, I might cover five questions in half an hour, right? So even knowing how many questions are going to be asked is important. The next part of it is, how do you structure your answer? And obviously we've said it, said it multiple times, the start method is the best way to structure your answer. And one of the reasons is because you won't forget the most important parts of your answer, right? As an example, you might spend a lot of time just telling, describing the situation, but what about the actions you took, the results you were able to garner? Those are more powerful examples for them to connect to that specific skill or quality that they're looking for. Knowing how many questions that are coming up that are, is really important. So that way you can figure out, do I need to answer this question really quickly, or do I need to take my time to walk them through the, the STAR method? We should actually, maybe, can you give... If you can take uh, from the top of your head, the most the most popular or the most common interview behavioral questions. You mean, you mean technical or behavioral? Behavioral. I think there isn't any specific one that... I, I think that's also the key, right? To know that the questions can be asked in slightly different, in different ways. Yeah. But the biggest, I, I think the biggest thing is when you hear something like, give me an example, tell me about it time right? That should immediately trigger in your, in your mind that you need to provide a specific example and you can take your time. I guess one of the, one of the most common ones are like team focused, collaboration focused. You could ask the same question mm -hmm. 12, 15 different times, but I would say collaboration focus is probably the, the biggest one for QA engineers. I would say would be, tell me about a difficult bug or tell me about a time you had a hard time convincing a developer that it was a bug, right? Those are really common questions from a behavioral perspective. Yeah. And it just pops up in my mind, like from the last mock interview sessions that we did with Eugene, he asked about time when he, when the person candidate made a big mistake that, or like mm -hmm. a mistake that did a big impact into the business and what was the outcome. Yeah, this definitely like how and when but at the same time i want to touch this thing right because star method great it's but for qa i think it's a little bit challenging to answering in the only star method and i got this question all the time oh i was just testing what are what is the result the measurement result was going do you have some like thoughts about it yeah what why don't we why don't we do our own mock interview ask ask me Pretend you're the interviewer. I'm the candidate. Ask me the. Fun. Yeah, let's do I'll, this. Um, I'll walk through my answer, and then we can dissect the answer. And just like for everybody else, it's off the cuff, so doesn't mean that I'll hit it out of the park the first time. But it's all about practice, right? So yep. I'm just yep. gonna pretend me. Everyone is helping me with my interviewing skills. Yeah. Okay. For example, let's leverage this question about the mistakes. Ideal. Can you tell me about a uh, time when you? did a mistake or when let's let's be specific to QA to testing when you miss a bug into production can you tell me this this story okay i have a few different examples in mind maybe i'll start start with this specific 
one. And if it resonates, I can provide more detail or provide more follow-up questions. This was, this was a little while ago. I was testing a, 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 an integration with, the, with our backend system and our ERP solution. We had a small release where we were shipping out a new feature. And, and to long story short, there was a defect missed, which caused the queue to overflow and the service to service to go down in production. Wow. So one of the, one of what happened is these things run on a batch process going through the SDLC process. I had a list of changes. I tested them, did a regression and pushed it into production where I verified things were working. I, I didn't do all of those things myself, but I'm involved in all of those processes. So I did that and, and then suddenly got a report, suddenly got alerts from the queue management system saying there are still messages on the queue and, and, and things are not being processed. I jumped in to investigate what was happening. I could see the queue length, typically when you're processing a big batch, it can get thousands of messages, but it was sitting at it was sitting at four or 5,000 messages and, and growing. And I knew the max queue limit was 10,000 and which was very unusual. So I responded to that alert. I let my team know right away that I was investigating. When I say team, it was just me and a couple of developers. I let them know, I let our PO know, our product owner know what was going on. And we basically started to triage the issue right away. Long, since you want me to focus on the defect part, long story short, what I missed was, I missed was basically what as the backend system was building this message it missed it missed adding a required field that was required mm -hmm. and when it was being processed there were failures caused it was a pretty important payroll process that went down but we still had we still had we were some checks going out were missed because of this i was able to i some of the things that i did differently going forward as i learned from this incident whereas putting in automation for all required fields that that was there. I also fine tuned our alerts. So instead of waiting for the alert I got was the stale messages in the queue mm -hmm. and the length of the queue. Instead, I put in alerts for if, if a required field is missed, send, make that a high, make that a higher priority alert. So we could respond right away if it was missed. So I tried to shift left. I didn't ensure that it didn't happen again, but also if it did happen, improve our obs observability so we can react before, before the process or system goes down. What did you learn from this? I had two big takeaways from this. One of them was the input validate, mm -hmm. input output validations, like covering those is like super important, making sure that the look, looking at it like holistically is really important. So making sure those ca cases are covered and not just covered. They're automated because there's so many nuances. This is a pretty big message, a hundred, a hundred fields in this message. It's not really possible to do this, to, to verify this manually. So verify the input, all the required fields are there. In fact, taking it a step further, work with developers to put it in their unit tests. So it, it doesn't even happen again. Yeah. I'm not in the business of finding issues. I'm in the business of making our customers happier. And if I can do that by preventing issues, that's my goal. And number two is. Observabil observ observability is really important. Making sure I have the right alerts in place. My team can respond to issues as soon as they can happen because you cannot, oh, this also shows you, there's no such thing as no bugs in production. Time to respond, time to fix issues are super crucial. Dude, I, it just pops up in my head, this idea. I love these stories. Why don't we just talk and discuss this type of testing stories? software testing QA stories that happened at the end incidents, right? And how we can leverage into the interviews. I can actually tell my story as well, very similar to your, like to this question, what I would also add maybe when you had to roll back, what did you learn, right? So yeah, when I was participating in a backend development team, it was basically the re just to give the context of what I'm talking about. That was a redesigning of existing uh, software, but from the scratch, new technologies, the data that that this software consume would be the, the same, but the representation of this data would be different. So this team started from scratch. They got new develop a new team, new developers. And it was very like intense, very intense. And uh, requirements was also like changing on the fly. Anyway, we already did the release of this initial MVP and we had another release 
on this release, what was what happened? Basically, we had to roll back. Why they had to? Roll? One of the services we responded for a four, and it wasn't actually covered. So I, as a tester, I tested the certain features, the, the, the certain me methods, actually, right? But one specific part wasn't in my radar, and it wasn't part of the requirement, but at the same time, that was a big deal because of this feature that gives, it, it, it's basically, it just went down. So we had to roll back. And because of the main focus was on another feature and the all testing was done around this feature on another feature and didn't cover this one. So what happened? I took my lesson. I said, okay, I had to build up the smoke tests, like for smoke check for all crucial features that should be up, right? Maybe won't be able to cover the whole regression for all features since we limited the resources. But for specific features that they are returning back like 200 and the right form in JSON, that would be good enough for this type of coverage. And lesson learned, edit, implemented these, these smoke checks and... Yeah, move forward. That was right. my... I, I think one observation that I hope everybody can take out of this is how Evgeny answered this question. It's really important when he's making important emphasis tone and his body mm -hmm. does a little bit that. That if you were writing something, you would put something in bold. He's He is highlighting his key contributions. He's providing context, but he knows that the context may not be super may not always be super relevant or super interesting. So he's running through the context really quickly and focusing on the important stuff. When he gets to the important stuff, he is taking his time to emphasize. It's a good way to structure your answer. And I'll maybe have a little bit of criticism for how I answered the question. Not really criticism, but just keep in mind, I wasn't able to provide any in his answer. We didn't cover like specific metrics or information about did it have ever happen again? How likely? Those kind of details, especially if it's like I mentioned, if it's an interview where they're asking a few other questions, so they're going to be follow-up questions. And this is where talking about our stories is really important. You should be doing the same thing in your for yourself. You should be talking about these stories for yourself and then writing them down in your notes. So when you're interviewing, you can refer to it. It can help you jog your memory. And if you have important data points associated with it, as an example, we talked about specific issues, but what if it was like, what if our answer was like lead time focused, right? Then I would, we should have like specific data points like, oh, this service was taking two seconds to respond. How did I get it to 200 millisecond? Whatever it is, you can write those. What point being, you can take, you can put the situation down, but you can also write little data points that you can, that may not be as easy to jo uh, to remember in the moment, but if you have them in your notes, it's easy to share that back and, and they can be, be like, they can take a okay answer to a good answer. And, yeah. and also with practice, you can take a good answer to a excellent answer. You know what? I also would add here that it depends with uh, whom you are doing the the behavioral interview, right? Obviously, like when you do the mock, not mock, uh, the real interview with, uh, but the engineer is going to be mostly technical and less behavioral, but the question may cross functioning. They can actually repeat it. And if I would be with managers, as Eugene mentioned, they looking something specific metrics, they looking something thrown numbers. And this is actually challenging for engineers and for QAs. What was the impact of the feature that we just released? I heard the numbers during the meetings. Oh yeah, we released this feature. It uh, gained the revenue, blah, blah, blah. But in day-to-day -day activities, do I measure? Not really, right? How many dollars it brings up all well, the efficiency maybe yes definitely the time efficiency i measure all the time this execution cost me let's say one hour and now i can run it in 15 minutes right that's a lot <laughs> yeah do, you can do some quick math on the fly for sure if if that's the focus but where he's where he, what he is coming from and he's sharing for sure if you're going into whether it's a technical or behavioral or a system design interview with somebody like Amazon, you're going to need the, you're going to need the details because they're going to ask way fewer questions. Yeah, and well, they really want to dig into that answer. 
at a typical one, like if a typical behavioral question interview for them may only cover three questions mm -hmm. in 45 minutes. So imagine the level of detail that might be required there. And like you said, it really does depend. But if somebody's asking 12 questions in 45 minutes and they're really focused on just getting enough information to say, yes, they address this situation correctly, they, they want that information very quickly and they don't want to be bogged down with, with, with too, many, too many of those nuances, details. Um... Yeah. And the other thing I want to say about that question, that, that mistake question, is to understand like the variations, how it's asked. You can ask it in a way where it could be very open-ended just mm -hmm. to see where somebody mm -hmm. takes it. But they're looking for things like self-awareness. Did you, so really, there are some bad, to, what that means is there are some bad answers, right? Bad answers are, oh, there was this issue, but there was no impact of that issue. It's not necessarily, that answer will never be an excellent, because of the situation you picked, it will never be an excellent or even good. It, it can be an okay answer, depending on the information you did, how you reacted. So being able to pick up on that or talking about an issue where you, you just say it wasn't my fault. You'll just say it was a developer's fault or somebody else's fault. Those are like, those are questions at best. Like you could be the best interviewer, but if you pick the wrong situation, you can maybe only get it to okay or so-so answer. You can never get it to a good or excellent answer. So that's, it's important to keep in mind why that question is being asked and if you can address that. And just like I said, I think Evgeny did a really good job. Go back in the recording and check like how he raised his, tilted his head a little bit, raised his voice a little bit to emphasize and slow down a little bit to emphasize the key points, what he learned from it was brilliant. Thank you. I didn't know that. <laughs> anyway. It's the uh, subtle things. It's the subtle things, but these are all happening. There's so much. The other part of the conversation is subconscious, subconscious bias, or, or even meaning what's the, what's the famous line? Like 70% of all, commu all, all communication is like nonverbal, right? Yeah. Yeah, these are things that are really difficult for you to pick up on your own. And it's really difficult for me to pick up for myself. If I want to practice interviewing, I need to do it with somebody else because I cannot pick on the, on the nonverbal parts of the communication, my body language, my voice, how I'm looking. I, can't, I cannot do that for myself. In fact, I'll just overthink it, right? If I look at a record, I, I go back and look at this recording. And with, Anyway, I hate looking at my recordings. I never look at them unless I have to edit the video. <laughs> Again, he knows this. I'll be just too focused on, man, some weird part. Oh, my, my button was, was open and I can't really. So it's really important to get help with somebody, for somebody whether it's a, somebody else who's looking for a job, somebody senior you trust, or you go out there and find a mentor. We also had a question from on the, in the chat. What questions make an impression with you as an interviewer? If they can ask those questions, that's a good one. That's a really good one. I, I think Eugene did a really good job of covering that, like maybe a couple of months ago. But this is, I love this question because I like where the thought process is. And this is what I always say, like interview doesn't end when the interviewer goes, hey, do you have any questions for us? Or do you have any questions for me? The interview hasn't ended. So being deliberate and thoughtful about the questions you ask is really important. I think it depends on who you're interviewing with whether or not you're interviewing with the manager uh, or somebody else. Everybody has some of their favorite ones, but I would say same thing with this one. Write down in your notes what questions you want to ask. Be genuine about it. Right? It will come through if you're just reading off some question that you picked up from chat GPT. Be genuine. If you're talking to peers, people you'll be working with, asking them about what's the best part of their jobs, worst part, those are some generic ones. But as you're going through the interview, if you can ask really specific, good questions. I have a very good story there, Evgeny, like a long time ago, we had a candidate who did okay. I, I would say okay to solid interview we had with this person. But at the end, this person asked really good questions. So this is for a QA engineer. And at the time it came, it was like, it was a fine line between junior, experienced and senior engineer. We mm -hmm. went with the senior we went with the recommendation that we should offer a senior level position to this person. And I have to think like part of it was the really good questions they asked at the end, their engagement. So your goal should be asking questions that get the interview, that, that gets the interviewer talking. That's, I think those are really good questions. Ultimately, give them open-ended questions that they can really sink their teeth into. You know, uh, if you're talking to somebody from like product management, maybe you want to talk about business or product side, those would be some hints there. 
the way how I try to turn the interviews, whether I'm interviewing or like I've been interviewed, I try to make it as a dialogue, not just monologue, right? Not like a quiz. What is this? What is that? And you just hit him back with the responses, waiting for another responses. I usually try to make as a dialogue, like what we do right now, right? As you like, we two people just talking exchanging our opinions, exchange, exchanging our thoughts and ideas and experience at the same time, right? If I would go with to the end and if I make sure that I ask all questions that I want to know about the company, about the processes, about the hard time, like why you're hiring for this position? Why Not with the, like, with the attitude, why? But is this for specific project? What kind of project, right? So, so you have to cover this part of, as well, like very... And usually interview the hiring managers or like interviewer, they usually cover this part in the beginning, also very briefly, right? But you want to dig down, right? Well, what is the challenges you guys have? Or maybe the pre in QA in your QA team, right? Or this development team specifically. Yeah, I would say very product team specific questions. I would ask. Let's cover a couple of examples of and we can I think we're over time, <laughs> yeah, we'll wrap yeah. up. Uh, but a couple of, I think the, maybe I'll give an example of a couple of bad ones and maybe Evgeny, you can give a couple of bad ones. If you make it sound like an acquisition, accusation, making a question sound like an accusation yeah. is a is a really a bad way to yeah. ask a question. There's usually a better way to ask something if you're curious about. That's number one. Number two is not asking any questions. If you're interested let, in let, the acquisition, I do, curiosity. Give an example about acquisition. Like, for example, yeah, one could be maybe you picked up during the interview that you were not really happy as a QA person. You were not happy with the QA developer ratio. It came up in a different part of the question. So you get to your question part and you say, why is your why is your de developer to QA, QA ratio really poor? That's a really poor way to ask that question, right? Yeah. A better way is, can you tell me a little bit more about the team this may, this role may end up on and tell me about the, the different roles and different people in that team is a better way to ask that question. And you're getting much more specific answer about there's going to be two developers, one QA person. And then, you know, that's, you can ask follow-up questions based on that. You can make your own opinion. You can be like, oh, this is crap. There's 10 developers, 20 developers, one QA person. I don't want this job. That's okay. But ask, don't make it sound like an acquisition. Yeah. Ask questions that are that, that still ask the question that you're curious about. Don't necessarily, hold, but there's usually a better way to ask it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I can admit like uh, many, like in the beginning of a uh, career, when I was learning a lot about automation, I remember we've learned that like this uh, BDD is really not great way. And actually it wasn't designed for testing, right? And I was arrogant enough to ask this type of acquisition question. Like, oh, why are you guys using Cucumber at, at your company, right? And the tone of my voice was arrogant. And the way how I asked this, oh, are you guys dumb using this? Wait, basically, that's what I said, right? I didn't ask to ask, really. So totally agree with you. And I admit I was arrogant as well. So, yep, that's a good one. That's a good one. What else? What else? Follow-up question. No question at all. Acquisitioning question. No question. And what else? The bad type of questions. What else? I think, oh, yeah, the other ones are... It's how you form your question, but a lot of times questions bring out the bring out baggage. Sometimes questions mm -hmm. at the end for interviewers bring out baggage, right? If you are currently working at a in a company that has a very toxic culture, mm -hmm. you're working nights and weekends all the time, asking questions like, hey, you maybe you're asking your peers like about hey, how often, how many hours are you working? Or how late are you working in a day? How many weekends are you working? Are it's how you ask that question. If it's important to you, I say, go ahead and ask it. But it's how you ask a question. When you go in your mind, you're just curious about something, but no, you're actually subconsciously bringing a lot of baggage to that question. And then it starts being a conversation and you're like, yeah, my current company, they have the, I hate working nights and weekends and that's it. The reason is to be careful in what context you're bringing that up. You're you're bringing up like, man, this person, if you don't have the greatest of interview and this last questions are like, this person seems really burned out. This person seems like they're in a really toxic situation. They had other parts of the interview, paired that question with other parts of the interview where they bashed their uh, previous company. 
that's going to leave an overall impression that you, again, you don't necessarily want to leave. And there's a better way to ask. There's a better way to ask that question. You can talk about, make it, ask it in a more open-ended way. Like how do you, what, if you're talking to a manager, ask them like, Hey, what is your idea of work-life balance? And go off of that. You're going to get a much open-ended answer where you can determine whether this is a person that you want to work for or not, rather than it be, yeah, that would be the other one. Your questions can bring a lot of old baggage. Make sure, that's why I say, write down your questions, at least some questions to go to in, in case you end up where you don't have really good specific questions. Like maybe you're really curious about their conversation about cucumber, right? You can ask the cucumber question as a curiosity as opposed to an, as opposed to bringing baggage from previous time where you tried to implement BDD in your previous company. Yeah, yeah. And definitely you can, it doesn't mean that you should not ask this question. It means that you have to turn around, you have to formalize this question in a different way, right? If you are really interested in what is the work-life balance there, I think you you gave a good example. What is, what is your thought about the work balance? Uh, and maybe you can find it out with within actually asking this question you can find it out oh can you explain how w w what is your release cycle looks like what is basically trying to find out the processes and if they really work on the weekends and the nights they will spill it out definitely they will tell you like oh like last saturday we did we fixed something it's like red flag okay saturday we release something every saturday at 11 p.m like, yes, oh, yes. That's a big red flag. That's a big red flag. Totally. <laughs> Run away. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and, oh, and I guess the last one is asking still a valid question, but asking it in the wrong phase or to the wrong person. As an example, if you have a PTO coming up, you're interviewing for this job, you have a wedding coming up, that's a better question to be asked of a recruiter. And totally. usually better at the tail end, if there's a verbal offer that's following up, if you need to take a week off in a month, it's usually not, it's usually not a big deal. Like asking that at the wrong time is you're taking valuable time away from something that can help inform your decision to, to go with this job or, 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 or leave a good impression. You're taking that time away to talk about something that's not, I, I don't really think it's like really significant. To yeah. Discuss. Yeah. I would say it's actually leading to my another one example. Do not ask question in sake of asking question. That's usually, if it doesn't make sense in the head of interview, like, why did you ask this? This is the bad, this is a bad question. So if you're not really interested in this question, if you, in the context of this question, don't ask this, right? Don't pick it from, don't pick it up from chat GPT and just blurt it out. Yeah. That's not a good question. We run the group coaching sessions twice a week in the private group. If you want to know about it, I'll post a link. The first week will be free trial coming in, jump in, bring your resume. We'll ask you questions. We'll do the mock interviews. You will do with mock interviews with Adil. You'll do mock interviews with Eugene Polonsky and you do the mock interviews with Ken, with George Andros, all amazing engineering managers, directors, product managers. For example, Eugene is engineering manager at Amazon. George, he is a director of QA at formerly was at Apple and Amazon, I believe. Ken, he was leading over dozens of uh, startups hundreds, of... hundreds of interviewing hours between that group probably like more thousands yeah. more like yeah. a, thousands of hours whether it's interviewing other people or interviewing for other jobs so you're just getting a ton of experience yeah and again if you want to look into this privately just sign it in to we'll do the free resume review for you guys here i'll see you two weeks later and drop in, jump into our mock interviews like today. Don't be afraid. It's a good opportunity to get the feedback. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Adil. I'll talk to you guys later.